Uh, we had some uh, more libertarian messaging coming out. Some people thought oh, that was bad. And uh, all of a sudden, the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire found itself uh, disappeared somehow. And it was totally against the bylaws of the LPNH, it was totally against the bylaws of the National Committee. Um, but what happened was, we had one person who said, I don't understand what's going on here. I don't know what's going on in New Hampshire, and this doesn't seem right. And she went and investigated it when everyone else was sitting on their, sitting on their hands. We had property stolen, we had, uh, we had our, our, our accounts frozen, uh, we had uh, hundreds of, of party members who lost all this property, and libertarians were not moving on this. This, is, this was theft, and this was security breaches, and libertarians were not moving on it, except one. Okay, we had a champion in Karen Ann Harlow's. Uh, so she went to bat, uh, she led the, uh, uh, the, the, the counter, she uh, uh, documented what had happened, and basically now we're in the clear. So uh, one of my heroes is here today, and I'm just so excited to be introducing Karen and Harlow. Give her a big, big hand. Because he's heard them so much. 
And you guys will hear some repeat things if you heard me on Tom Woods or Dave Smith, but some of you haven't. And usually there's some additional details. So some things probably in the intro you will have heard before. I am the National Secretary for the Libertarian Party. Um, like Game of Thrones, titles, titles, whatever, whatever. Um, the things I'm most proud of, though, is earning the secretary spot, but I'm also the chair of the Libertarian Party Historical Committee. That's where my heart really is at, is in the history of the party. And I've done Colorado things. I've uh, been two-time chair of the platform committee. I'm interim chair this time, and hopefully permanent, permanent chair again, but we shall see. I have a different, we all have our different stories of how we came to libertarianism, but I'm going to, I'll be taking these on and off, old sucks, that's all I can say, and I can't, I can see and then not see. But how I came to libertarianism is a bit different than anyone I've ever met. I didn't know a libertarian. I didn't know anything about libertarianism. I was in a debate with some Christians, and if you think libertarians debate, <laughs> no, 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 Christians, man. Woo, they're the worst. And uh, we were arguing about whether or not there should be spikes under overpasses so that homeless people can't sleep there. And I was appalled because the Christians were arguing for it. And I was from a fundamentalist sect. And it was the type of sex when it was sex. Woo, there you go, it was a sexy church. Um, it was one of the sects uh, that when you accepted Jesus, you also accepted the Republican Party into your heart. So. I was a registered Republican, but I didn't vote. I, didn't, I hated politics. But it was, you know, a bunch of Republicans that I was arguing with. And they were getting so angry with me for not being in favor of the ass spikes underneath the overpass that they called me a liberal. And back then, you'd rather have been called anything. That was just like, you know, you'd run away like someone's chasing you with a syringe full of AIDS. So, um, I, I pulled a, a debate move, it's a very technical term, it's called an ass fact, where you just pull a fact out of your ass, hoping it will get you out. And I said, no, 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 I'm more of a libertarian, because I heard that word, and I thought it would get me out of this charge. And then I realized I didn't know what it meant, and the last time I said something I didn't know what it meant, I called myself a hose beast. And if any of you know what that is, that's probably not something you want to call yourself in a Christian form. So I um, decided I would better look this up before I have another hose beast incident. So I went to LP.org on lunch. My husband was going out to get me lunch. And I read the platform. Actually, I didn't get through the entire platform. I read the statement of principles in the preamble. At the end of the preamble, I opened a new browser tab and immediately switched my registration on the spot to Libertarian. It was, it was like that. That the skies opened and the angels sang. And my husband comes back with lunch, and I said, hey, I just switched my voter registration. He's like, you know, I'm like, well, yeah, you know. And I said, the libertarian, and he's like, there's a libertarian party? I'm like, yeah, you know, it's interesting. And I, I thought that would be the end of it, actually, because um, I didn't plan on voting. But then I saw an ad on Facebook for a t-shirt, and I'm like, fuck, I want that t-shirt. And that actually was the downfall for me, was that fucking t-shirt. So I joined the National Party to get, I don't have it with me, actually, to get that t-shirt. So I say it is a magical t-shirt. It's that black long stamp one that says libertarian on the front. And that really sucked me in. But I didn't meet a libertarian for three months, and thank fucking God I didn't meet a libertarian for three months. Because I probably would have ran away screaming. But in those three months, I kind of settled into my new identity, which was a really a new identity. Six months prior, I was arguing for single payer, like in front of bunches of people. And that's very embarrassing. I don't know what's worse, the hose beast or the, the single payer. So I haven't met anyone else with a story like that that just simply read the platform. I didn't know a damn thing, and I hated politics. I still hate politics, by the way. I think that's really the only appropriate response for uh, politics. I, I, and the expression I like to use is that I hate it. I hate it with the with the heat of a thousand burning suns. But the the talk today that we'll be getting into is bold messaging. And 
it's funny because coming here, I guess it's my reputation that, that, that brought me here. But um, this isn't my first time at the Controversy Rodeo. And it's funny, when people had said what's going on now, it's like, oh, don't worry about it. The convention's in 10 months. I go, 10 months is a long time. That's 20 more dramas away, at least. And uh, when I was only on the LNC, and I got in the LNC only been in the party a month and a half. People think the pink hair was just like me being strange. It actually was, I know what I'm doing. It was a marketing strategy. I knew nobody knew me. But if you do something where people remember you, you might get elected. And people don't remember names, I don't, but everyone remembers the pink haired lady. And that's why I dyed my hair pink. It was a marketing strategy to get elected to the LNC. Why did I want to get elected to the LNC? Um, our former chair, thankfully, not the former former, that's another thankfully, but the, the immediately former chair really had a problem with people who were on the LNC because they didn't like the LNC, but I'm on the LNC because I don't trust it for shit. I've seen, I've seen how the sausage is made and I wouldn't eat it. But, uh, and I like sausage normally. Um, I, I learned what happened in Oregon. And I, I was appalled that the National Party did that to Oregon. And if you don't know, it's a long ass story I'll end up doing on my show one day. But I like researched Oregon obsessively. I was writing for IPR at the time. I've done yeah. most articles on Oregon that there, there was. And I said if they did it to Oregon, they could do it to Colorado. And I wanted to protect Colorado. And this is what's funny. This actually is like a fulfillment. Is I got on the LNC to protect affiliates. This is the first time I ever got to do it. But I gladly did it. But I have to be honest with you, it was also protecting Colorado in surrogate. And protecting you guys, I'm protecting my own state as well. But that was my whole goal to get on the LNC. So I feel like, you know, in 2016 when I got on there, it was for here, it was for now. And I couldn't be pr prouder of you guys and, and prouder of myself that I was able to do that. We love you! But uh, some of the other controversy rodeos, just so you can get an idea of where I come from. So I was on the LNC, I think, well, I was elected in 2016, so it was when we were signing a campaign contract with Gary Johnson. Some of you might not even know when this happened. Um, our former, former chair and uh, the LNC attorney, I'm not a big fan of either. Um, and that's very well known. But they signed a contract, and we trusted because our former, former chair and our former one are both attorneys. God, I can't get attorneys out of my fucking life. I'm a parallel. Uh, you know, assured us that there was nothing bad. This was a good contract. So we gave them authority to sign it. And then I found out there was a clause in that contract that was to be kept secret from the membership forever.
someone said, didn't you just get noted? So I thought that was pretty funny, the lack of self-awareness there. And, and I'm not unself-aware that a lot of times, a lot of my fellow LNC members don't like me. But I think that happens with all of them. If they're doing their job, there's institutional inertia. It's not that the people in the LNC are bad people. It's that people who get into power, it makes them weird. And that's, that's why I'm voluntarily term limiting in three terms if I get reelected. I think three terms in any one seat is enough. Every single person I've seen in their third term goes a little batshit. And I don't care if you go to another seat, but you lose your freshness. Like Alicia Matson, who was the secretary before me, is the best secretary. A lot of people might have ideological issues with her, but she's the best secretary I've ever seen. And I hope at the end of my third term, people will think I'm half as good as Alicia Matson. But it got stale. When I first got on the LNC, there were some basic things that could change. Same thing's gonna happen when I lose the seat or when I voluntarily give it up. My successor is gonna come up with things and be like, oh shit, that was pretty obvious. We should always be looking for our successors if we really care about freedom. But, so that's kind of the background. There, there's, there's probably more controversies that I, I'm just not thinking of, but this one here, this was the doozy boy. So, if you don't know, the political assassination has been called off upon me. So, I, I get my legal background because, you know, working in the legal field, I, I know how to gunk up the works quite a bit. I think they saw that this was going to go on until convention, so might as well just end it now. So, when I put this on today, my name match, I'm like, still here, bitches! <laughs> want to lose my seat, that would have been embarrassing, and it also would have been subverting the will of the delegates, because the, the charge against me that was that I was indecorous. Clutch your pearls. She says, she says fuckers and bitches too many times, and apparently a certain senator, former senator from Nebraska, didn't like that. But the thing is, it, what people don't understand is everyone's different. I walk into a room and go, hello, bitches, it's not an insult. That's just what I do. I mean, fuckers, sometimes I say that fondly, but sometimes not quite so fondly. But if that's what you're more concerned about, rather than, I'm a Christian, so I will make biblical analogies, I make no uh, uh, apologies for that, but it's just wisdom, where Jesus was talking to the Pharisees of the day, they were the people really concerned about the quorum, and said, you tithe of your spice rack, but you neglect the weightier aspects of the law, truth and justice and fairness. And, and the people on the LNC were more concerned with my potty mouth than the weightier issues of truth and justice and fairness. And I just think that's appalling. And I think the way they were trying to deny me due process was absolutely appalling. Because the fact is, that suspension clause wasn't for people who didn't like their colleagues. It was if you stole shit or you assaulted somebody or you had a radical change and were not the person the delegates elected. But there ain't nobody who voted for me at convention that didn't know what they were buying. Hell, I was walking around, there was a flyer spread about me at convention because somebody had threatened to sue me because they were a Native American. And I said, well, my federally protected vagina trumps your Native Americanness." So it's not like anybody knew, didn't know what they were getting. So this LNC was trying to subvert the will of the delegates because they didn't like who the delegates chose, but the delegates knew what they were getting, and they have the right to elect somebody the rest of the LNC doesn't like. And if I change to make that argument, then you would have a good removal case. But to have an LNC think that they could just subvert, I, I called it a post-election abortion, they thought they could do that is just absolutely crazy. And the state chairs that approved that, shame on you too. You don't get to override the will of the delegates because you don't like their choice. Because that's what happened with you guys, isn't it? Somebody didn't like the choice of the delegates and they thought they were gonna subvert it. At least the coup that the LNC tried was nominally within the rules, though it was ethically wrong. Not everything that you're, as I said, there's a lot of things you have the right to do, but it doesn't make it right to do. And that's what was going on there. And what the decision that got made for me for due process, of course it was a victory for me.
but I know five years from now it's going to be a precedent for someone else's ass. I didn't stand up just for me. I stood up for the person that was going to be the subject of this next. Because Angela Keaton was the subject of this in 2008. The LNC, because of Bob Barr and all that bullshit, she was making political satire and they didn't like it one bit. And they set her up too. She resigned. I wasn't going to give them the satisfaction because I'm stubborn. If someone wants me out, even if I wanted out, I'd stay to spite them. But the fact is, politics is going to happen whether you hate it or not. And as our former former chair said, the parties who shows up, I guess until you don't like it, shows up. <laughs> so I often say, as a joke, but it's it's kind of most jokes have a, a a reality to it. That's why they're funny. The Libertarian Party is really good at some things, believe it or not. They are really, really good at two things. Taking a small government constitutionalist and turning him into an anarchist in short order, which they did to me in 10 months. But here's the unfortunate part, taking that anarchist then and getting them completely out of politics, which is usually happens in the first two years. And I think that's very unfortunate because again, politics is going to happen. And the problem that's happened, there's a lot of problems with the LP, but part of the problem is in the beginning, had anarchists in the party. I don't think I've met an honest to God anarchist in a long time. We've become very modal. There's anarchists, and then there's I don't know what the fuck sometimes. And I really wish we would have a bunch of good old fashioned anarchists. I mean, I joke with them, but hell, I'd be happy if we got to that. I'd find another hobby if we got to actual anarchy. I know it wouldn't, probably wouldn't last two weeks, but I'd have two weeks off. Menarchy pet that says, Holy fuck, it keeps growing. <laughs> so, why do I think politics and being involved as an anarchist is important? I don't think of the Libertarian Party as a political party, I think of it as a social movement disguised as a political party. Because social change is ahead of political change. Political change only happens when the culture changes first. And that's what I think we need to be good at. And whether, I don't care what anyone thinks about me, I'm fascinated by them. They got the whole world talking about abolishing the police. That never would have happened. We can do that, not necessarily with that topic, though I'd be perfectly happy with that topic. I was married to a cop, so I have no, no love loss there. And, but whatever the topic is, we can do that. It doesn't take many people to change the world. Twelve disciples changed the world for Christianity. One desert nomad changed the world for Islam. The American Revolution was various statistics, but most people agree it was under 10%. We have that. We could do it. But we have to have the fire in our belly. And you do not have the fire in your belly with milk toast, uh, just watered down messaging. Because when you're telling people to go to third party, you're asking a lot. People do not go, people don't go to the to the stocks for watered down pansy ass you know, messaging. They just don't. There's no reason to. You have to inspire them. You have to make them peaceful revolutionaries. And the LP radicalized the fuck out of me. But that's it. I mean it in a good way. Because radical doesn't mean you know crazy or whatever. It means going to the root of something. You know and. We need to get back to our radical roots. That doesn't mean there isn't room for the moderates. I'm not a purger. But the moderates can't be driving the messaging. Just, we won't get anywhere if they do. They have every right to be here, and they're really good at some things, and they're gonna reach people I can't reach. People go, you shouldn't call yourself an anarchist, it scares people. It's only open doors for me. Maybe it's because I don't look like I'm about to throw a bomb at you. You know, I'm an almost elderly, pink-haired Colorado housewife, and I'm not that threatening. But for me, people are fascinated when they hear it. So I don't make other... Libertarians are so weird. We're so authoritarian sometimes about how other libertarians have to be. You know, and it's like, 
you do you, boo boo. That's what I think. I don't think we should be the party of principle. We should be the you do you, boo boo. Because most of the time we're the party of principle. So I, I've been through I actually did um, the whole COVID. We'll get to the COVID. I don't want to call it COVID messaging because there wasn't any. All right. So the LP is an image problem, and almost everybody would agree with that. If you say that in any room of libertarians, we're very good at self-hating. We're better than the Jews and the Catholics at self-hating. And I was raised Catholic, and the guilt is real, the self-hate is real. But we have an image problem. You say this to your average libertarian, and they will nod. They will nod sagely. But it will be for all the wrong reasons to appease all the wrong people. They will agonize about naked dancing man at convention, which nobody else remembers, or the mouthy, pink-haired libertarian secretary, as if anyone else in the world actually gives a flying fuck about either of those two things. They don't. But libertarians will agonize on those two things and navel gaze on those for fucking ever. Why? We're, we're, we don't need government spooks to sabotage us. We're, we're the best sabotaging ourselves with, with criticism. It's funny, somebody said, why would Ken want to be chair? I could go very random, I'm sorry. Not sorry. Because um, we need our own. If you haven't seen Ken lately, he's the Get Fit Caucus guy. He lost like 100 pounds. Like, oh, he's too skinny for us to eat him now. <laughs> but I like to compare, speaking of eating, our image problem is similar to an eating disorder. We don't dare taste our own wares. We preach it sometimes. But we don't dare taste our own wares, and we certainly wouldn't dare anyone else to eat it either. Well, you know what? I'm fucking hungry. And I want to taste our own wares. I want a full meal. And I'm done dieting. And anyone who's more offended by the fact that I've probably said fuck 50 times already, then get the fuck out of the way. Because the world is starving for freedom. And if we're locking the key to the larder, then we are just moral towards liberty. And we don't deserve the title of libertarian. That's an honor to have that, that title. So as John Phillips would say, a fellow LNC member who never was the subject of a suspension motion, though he always told people you could fuck them right off. Somehow it was just a problem when it came out of my mouth. Somebody who's more offended by that can just fuck the right off and get out of the way while I'm preaching to a hungry world. And that the rest of us should be with bold messaging, not bland <laughs> twaddle, which is what I call a paper twaddle, perfuming the hog, all that, uh, whatever else you might say. So, we didn't start out this way though as a party. I don't know how familiar you guys are with party history. And I think that's the real, you know, when I started saying I wanted to preserve the records, the moderates on the LNC said, we have, a, we have a storehouse of records, why don't we just throw them out? And I had this vision of myself <laughs> going to Virginia and chaining myself to that damn storage locker like some crazy fucking tree hugger. And, <laughs> and when they were trying to throw me off, you know, they only didn't want to suspend me from the LNC. It's a vindictive son of a bitch they wanted to remove me from all of my committee positions, even though that had nothing to do with anything, including the historical committee. And I'm going, well, the, the warehouse is right up the street now, and I've got some chains. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I really was having, having that vision. But our very first press release that I could find, there were probably earlier ones, but the 1974 convention minutes, I guess they didn't have the budget for paper because it was all on the back of these extra press releases. And the press release was, libertarians want to abolish all taxation. We don't hear that from many libertarians today. And what does all mean? All means all. You know, and nothing else. That's what it means. It means all. It means everything. And speaking of press releases, <laughs> I said about six months ago, the Libertarian Party finally put out a press release on COVID. And someone asked me, and this was sad, for or against. <laughs> And I laughed because that was a legitimate question. You know, um, I've been screaming for a, a, the whole time that we dropped the ball. And if we did not get off our asses, we should dissolve the party right now. 
I said that in an LNC meeting, and jaws dropped, and I absolutely meant it. And I said the same thing about what's going on now. If we can't uphold due process, the whole thing should burn to the fucking ground. And then people said to me, she wants to burn the party. That's not what I said. It's just like when, when I said, people got really mad at me because there was a certain censure motion I was threatened with, and I said, if I got censured for that, I would play it in gold and back to it. And then they said that I said that about any censure motion. No, you want to know what I was threatened for censuring, getting censured for, protecting you guys. And I would golden plate it and back to it. <laughs> but not any censure. I have my pride. You think I wanted to be suspended or censured? That's humiliating. Fuck, I've got the Wikipedia article. I'm going to tell something. I didn't want that on there. You know, I've got my pride. <laughs> but I got my principles, which is more important than my pride. So, we used to say, abolish the shit and replace it with fucking nothing. But today we hear, abolish the income tax and replace it with the fair tax. And that, or that expression just really makes me vomit in my mouth. We used to be hardcore, no particular orders, which is, Liberty is going to come the way liberty is going to come. We can't centrally plan it. We should know that above all people. But today, that's not what we're doing. So the party, in my, in my opinion, is an existential crisis. It's, it, it's rotting from within because we don't believe our own shit. I used to say to fellow Christians sometimes, you don't really believe in hell. And they're like, what? I go, if you really believed in it, that's all you would talk about. You would see your friends and go, oh my God, they don't really believe it. And sometimes I don't think we really believe what we say we believe. If we did, we'd be preaching it more. If we really thought that was the key to human flourishing, we really cared about people. I believe it. I can go, any conversation, my husband walks away, he's like, you go from zero to anarchy in 60 seconds. I go, I sure do. I don't waste no time, I'm getting old. I, you know, I, I get, it, I often say, somebody uh, ask people, is there anything in your life that makes you both simultaneously ec ecstatic and miserable at the same exact time? For me, it's anarchy. It, 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 uh, it makes me ecstatic to learn and then knowing that I was born a slave and I'm gonna die a slave, and that's just fucking depressing. And I would hope to be a little more free, you know, when I, when I finally go to my great reward. So, Today, you're lucky to find one libertarian who will have the guts to say abolish public schools. That's considered controversial now. Most libertarians would rather wet their pants than say an actual libertarian thing. And that's a shame. And so our last ticket, okay, I gotta hurry up here, I guess, you know, was a, a lying CFR gun grabber and a good man, but who was a semi-libertarian. I love Gary Johnson. I had the biggest crush on him until people were saying they were going to make a Gary Johnson sex doll for me. And he knows I have the biggest, the biggest crush on him at the convention. He kept teasing my husband, where'd you find such a hot wife? Gary Johnson, I just love him as a person. But he wanted to kill people over cakes. And why do I say that? Every law is enforced at the point of a gun. And if you got to bake the cake, he was willing to kill people for fucking cakes. That's insane. And you come against that, and the libertarians just think, you ran over their dog, backed up, and ran over again. So that's why I appreciated, actually, the child labor tweet that came out of here. I didn't think it was <laughs> think it was done the most artfully? No. But to me, that's like worrying about that the national secretary says fuck than rather about the actual work I'm doing. You should always learn the message a little bit better. But you dared to say something libertarian, and the libertarians were offended. <laughs> we, th there used to be a sect of ancient Christianity called the Gnostics, and they were theological snobs who felt that they had the mysteries to life, and they had to keep it to themselves and keep it from the boy of the Lord. Well, we act like that sometimes. We can handle the truth, but our neighbor can't. No, your neighbor's dying to hear this. And our audience is not the soccer moms in Peoria. It's not the status who are going to hate us. 
It's not. It's the, there's millions of people out there who are like me that just need to hear it. They are actually dying to hear an actually libertarian thing. And it will resonate for them. We need to, we don't need, don't be like, we're like Sally Fields. We want the whole world to go, you like us. You know, then they'll pat us on the head and go, good little toothless, you know, third party. We'll never get anything done. If we started preaching what we actually believe, we would change the world. And if we did that 50 years ago, we would have a very free world today. But we've been double-minded. I have a friend who wrote an article. His name's Mark Montoni. He's one of my libertarian heroes. And he wrote an article called, Why Hold Back If You're Not Going to Win? And there's an irony in there. And it's almost like where Jesus said in the Bible, the man who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life will gain the world. You're not going to win now, but if we don't hold back and we continue to not hold back, we will win. But pandering now? Why would anyone want to go to us to pander? We suck at it. We're not going to win. You know? If you're going to whore yourself, at least get fucking paid. <laughs> That's like the worst business prospect right there. We're lifting our skirts for everyone and we're not even getting paid. Hey, if you're gonna work that pole, make the bank. The Republicans and Democrats are much better than pandering, at pandering than us and they're gonna win. So we just not even play that game. Yeah. Say the truth. <laughs> and if we had done that, and if we start now, we will have a freer world. Because our ideas are what is best for people. Our ideas are the only ones that actually respect human dignity. And for me, it's the image of God I see in every human being. Where I would never, I'm, I'm a pacifist, I'm not a political one. I don't put it on you guys, enjoy your guns. It's a religious conviction because I would never destroy an image bearer. But the, the, doctrine or whatever you want to call it, of non-aggression is the answer. And why are we scared to share it? Go out there and be bold. Have the fire in your belly. And you will set other people on fire. And that is what's going to change the world. I don't care what your issue is. I, mean, I hate when libertarians go, is that the most important thing today? Fuck off. Whatever's the most important is what's most important to that individual. You don't get to tell them what's important to them. You know, if their thing is, I want chickens in my backyard, and that's all they talk about, well then, let them do it. Because my slogan for your libertarian activism is find what you love and let it kill you. And let me tell you, it almost killed me last week, that's for sure. But you will change the world doing that. Find your passion, find your bliss. But if you're going to be a libertarian, let's start changing the world. And that's through only, only through bold, unabashed, <laughs> pure, and I don't mean that in a purity spiral, I mean pure as in inspirational, aspirational, libertarian messaging. And it doesn't mean you can't not be libertarian on some issues, we all have our heresies. But just don't pretend it's libertarianism. I'm not fine with that. I'm fine with candidates who have to bake the cake. I just wanted him to be honest. It wasn't libertarian. And by the way, you might not know, I was on the Gary Johnson Policy Advisory Committee to get him to stop. And they pretty much said, that's nice. We're not going to listen to you. And the LNC doesn't have the guts to withdraw a nomination. One time we need to do that. Candidates start going off message. Bye, Felicia. And then I think all of a sudden, we wouldn't be the happy hunting grounds for the bridesmaids of the Republican Party. So, I actually wanted time for questions and answers. We only got like five minutes, but it's 10 minutes. Does anyone have anything? Because I, me, you point and go, I can talk for 10 hours. Does anyone have anything? Yes, sir. Pay attention to Heinemann's book, Take Back Your Government. If you can find a problem. Okay, I've never even heard of that. Thank you. I will. Yes.
probably won't do it anyway when you know you're not going to do it. Well, you don't know that, though. I, I, was, I was preaching single payer. Just say it. They're going to receive it or not. That's not on you. Just say it. And you not worry. it's your family and you know it's not going to sit right on them? <laughs> do it anyway. If it's the truth and you care about people, you'll tell them the truth. And then move on to more fertile grounds if they don't want to hear it. But we need to stop being scared. Why are we scared? I think, I preached on this, and I say preach because I do come from the church background, on courage. People think courage is being fearless. No, it's not. Being fearless is being a dumbass. The only people who can be brave are people who are scared. I was terrified this past week and a half, literally. But that's bravery, is being scared and doing it anyway. And that's what we need to do for liberty. Anyone else? Are you scared? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to conclude on that, let them clear up the stage. I have a, oh, here we go. Hello there. Hi, Karen. I just wanted to thank you for the, what you've done the last couple of weeks, and in general, you know, the little I followed you the last couple of years, you've always been pretty consistent, regardless of whether you like the person or not. So I just think we need more people like that in leadership of the parties, as well as, of course, in general leadership role in government and corporate. And so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Find the good and say, huh? Just because you don't agree with someone or like somebody, nobody. There's, there are no, there are no angels and demons. Everyone's a little bit of each, and you, you have to acknowledge the good and accomplishments even of your, of the people you don't particularly care for. So, if you like what I do, I'm not everybody's taste, and that's okay. Um, I do have a YouTube channel, Pink Flame of Liberty, and I'm getting skewered because it's monetized. It's a surprise that there's a libertarian who's a capitalist. I just, that to me was also astounding. Um, but also little known, I'm a Robert's Rules of Order person because I went to my first bylaws committee meeting and got the shit kicked out of me by M. Carlin and Aaron Starr. And I, I came out of that meeting and go, what the fuck just happened? That's never going to happen to me again. I'm going to make sure it doesn't happen to other people because these, the parliamentary priesthood was running this party. So I've taken it and making it understandable. I've got another YouTube channel called The Cult of R-O-N-R, where it says the heretics are in the temple. And uh, I would love to, you know, if you want to check that out, but I also volunteer. I'm getting my parliamentary certificate. Um, I volunteer, I will never charge libertarians. That's my service. But if any of you have a local affiliate, a local group, and you want me to give you guys a seminar on really demystifying Roberts, I'd love to do that for you. Just, just get in touch with me because that's a, another thing a friend of mine do. Because you can, it's for the masses, it's not just for the priesthood. So thank you everyone, and I'll be here the next few days. I would love to just fellowship with you and do liberty, liberty shit. And it's on the record now. I, I hope another suspension motion isn't coming. But uh, thank you, and I truly love you.